Today in Chapter 11, we will learn about meditating on and proclaiming the Word. Blessed is the one who meditates on the Word day and night. Whether you're at home, work, the marketplace, or church, how often do you meditate on the Word? Do you truly live in the Word daily? Let's look at the book of Psalms 1 verses 1 to 2. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Amen. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Brothers and sisters, have you ever experienced the feeling of not being able to put down the Bible because the very words are as sweet as honey? Are you experiencing this now? Have you ever experienced this in the past? The Word of God is our daily bread which provides us with life. It is a great delight to live by meditating on the Word. Indeed, it is said that delighting in the Lord is our strength, it is such a joy for us when we meditate on the Word. When I was in theological college, back when my son was an infant, the word was so sweet that I couldn't put the Bible down. So I had to put him to sleep or make him play with toys so that I could read the Bible. I remember around that time it was a great joy to read the Bible, and my son beside me listened to it as well. Sometimes I would accidentally read the Bible all night long. I couldn't put it down because I loved the word so much. I completely relate to the passage that refers to the Word as being sweet as a honeycomb. You need to get to this level of love for the Word. Brother and sisters, if you don't know what it's like to love the Word, or have no clue what it means, ask God. Say this in prayer, God, it is said that the Word is sweeter than a honeycomb. God, help me taste it. I want to experience it as well. Don't let me stray from your Word, God please help me. Ask him desperately. The more we know the Lord, the more we learn about him through the Bible. I pleaded before God in this way. God, I want to know who you are. Lord, I want to know who you are. It is said that you are my bridegroom whom I want to know, but I don't even know what you love. The Lord is my bridegroom, but I don't know much about him. God, I'd like to know you deeply, and I want to become intimately acquainted with you. Lord, please let me know you. I prayed in this way. One day the Lord said to me, Open the Bible. I wrote about myself in it, and reading it is knowledge of me. I realized, at last. I finally realized that the Bible is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I began to dig deeper into the Bible. Because the description of my bridegroom is in the Bible. Because I get to know who he is and have an intimate relationship with him through the Bible. The scripture says, Blessed is the one who meditates on the word day and evening and in the middle of night. When I read the book of Psalms chapter 119, David described meditating on the word as something that brought him great pleasure. It was probably a way of life for him. Let's open the book of Psalm chapter 119. Brothers and sisters, please read this scripture many times. Read it as often as you can. Psalm 119 verse 15. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. Verse 23. Though rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate on your decrees. It indicates that he meditated on the word. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. When the rulers mocked David's miserable life and questioned how he could be in such a state if God were his shepherd. David meditates Psalms 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. It is his psalm, isn't it? I assume he continuously read the Torah, right? Then let's read verse 48. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. Let's read verse 78. May the arrogant be put to shame for wronging me without cause, but I will meditate on your precepts. 
Let's read verse 95. The wicked are waiting to destroy me, but I will ponder your statutes. Pondering means meditating. It says he will ponder only the statutes and the word of the Lord. Let's read verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. It says that he couldn't help but keep the scriptures in his hands. Let's read verse 99. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. Meditating on the Word is better than any knowledge acquired from mentors and human teachers. Then let's read verse 148. My eyes stay open through the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promises. It means that he wakes up at dawn to meditate on the Word. It is said that if you diligently seek the Lord, you will find Him. The original meaning of seek desperately is seek Him eagerly, with all one's heart, and seek him at dawn. If your heart is desperate enough for you get up at dawn to meditate on his words instead of sleeping more, the Lord would see that and meet you. Today, in the book of Psalm chapter 119, we see David how he loves the words of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, David, who was after God's own heart, so dearly loved the word. Some people say I love Jesus but don't want to read the Bible. This is false. If you love God, you will love the Scripture which is the Word of God. If you love Jesus, you will surely love it. It is impossible for you to love the Word but not Jesus, for they are the same being. In the same way, David loved and meditated on it all day long. The meaning of meditating on the Word is eating the Word or cud chewing. For instance, a calf is eating fodder and swallowing straws. That is cud chewing. Once, he eats the straws and he returns the food from his stomach to the mouth to be chewed for the second time. Because it is not chewed well. In other words, he grinds it completely and swallows to digests well. So, what do I mean by that? When I read the words of God, I meditate on it until it becomes mine. For instance, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Yes, Lord. Since Lord is my shepherd, I am no longer needy. Lord, I am not needy in money, health and wisdom. For the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Brothers and sisters, think about it. However, we often think we are lack in everything. We think that we do not have enough money, health, wisdom, and so on. We feel lacking in so many areas. Indeed, what I want to tell you is, because we are always needy, the one who has everything came into us to make us live in abundance. To make us lack in nothing. Therefore, we are beings who rely on him. I don't rely on myself, you shouldn't rely on yourselves either. Scripture says in the book of Proverbs that he who relies on his own understanding is a fool. Whom we should rely on. We rely on Jesus Christ who is in us. He is my shepherd, and I am his sheep. The Almighty God is my shepherd. The one who heals all infirmities is my shepherd. The source of wisdom is my shepherd. The creator and perfecter of faith is my shepherd. The prince of peace is my shepherd. All these are revealed to us in our spirits. And then what? Wow, I have become a being who carries such a shepherd in me. So, doesn't it go without saying that such a shepherd would take care of his sheep? It is written, He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet water, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If we are his sheep, we are in the pastures while he stands beside us in the pastures. And what is more, to put the shepherd in us, Jesus Christ died on the cross and resurrected. In order that he may live forever within me and not depart from me. And to utilize us as a tool of the Lord. Therefore, because he put himself within me, I can live healthy, wealthy and wisely for my entire life. I live by walking with him. Once I realize this in my heart, I can say, oh, I really don't lack anything at all. 
Whenever I am in need, I can rely on him and ask Lord, I need this. Then, the Lord will grant my request and even go so far as to take my spirit outside of my flesh because I know I lack nothing in him. God is our Father. Brothers and sisters, think about it. Suppose that your father is the CEO of a large corporation. Say that you need $1,000. And then you go to your father and ask for $1,000. Don't you think he gives you the money? Of course, he would. Because you're his son and he is wealthy, he'd give you the money. But he will only give it to you if you ask. Unless you ask him first, he wouldn't give it to you. The father who is the CEO of a large corporation is physically far from us. Whereas our father has come into me, for he dwells within us, he provides us with our needs if we ask him. God has created us to be dependent on him. And the father has come into us. God is not far away from us in heaven as in the Old Testament. But he has come into us in the New Testament. God now resides in our hearts, not outside of our bodies. God was outside of our bodies during the time when the apostles and Jesus were on earth. But how did that change after Jesus was resurrected and went up to heaven? He has gone into the apostles. He died and resurrected so that he could come into us. How thankful we are to God. We will never be separated. Truly, the words of God are so precious. I genuinely love them. I love them so much. One day, he said nations such as the Middle Eastern or Islamic countries forbid missionaries from bringing in Bibles. I may call you to go there as a missionary. Would you go there without it? So, I answered, Yes, Lord. I will willingly go. The reason why he asked this kind of question to me is because I used to think that I couldn't live without the Bible. I used to say, Lord, I can't live without the Bible, I will take it with me if you send me to a desert island. I am okay being alone all day long even for several days and nights or months as long as I have the Bible with me. Because all I care about is my relationship with the Lord through it. But he asked me that question a long time after I stopped thinking that way. He asked me that question when I had been enlightened in many aspects. He asked me, can you go without the Bible? I said, yes, Lord. I can go. Lord, do you know why I can go? Because the author of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, is in me and won't leave me. Thus, I can go without the Bible. Because the author of the Bible knows all the contents of it. He makes me remember and enlightens me when I don't know the scriptures. Therefore, wherever I'm allowed to bring it with me, I will go with it. The Bible should be the first thing taken with me. But, even if I can't go without it, Lord, I will obey and go. For the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible and is dwelling within, coming with, and won't depart from me. And the people of such nations can't keep me from the Holy Spirit. For He is in me, and we are one, so they can't separate me from the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible is outside of my body as a physical object, it can be separated from me. On the contrary, the Holy Spirit lives within my body, so we can't be separated. Wow, I finally understood this mystery. After understanding this, I was so excited. Wow, I see, Lord. Even when I pass by at night without it, I am not afraid. Because the author of it is in me and he makes me remember the words to meditate on and tells me the word. Yes, indeed. The word of God should be within our spirit all the time. When the word of God is within our spirit, there are many blessings in the book of Proverbs that God will bestow upon us. Brothers and sisters, eat the word of God. By that, I mean meditate on it or cut to it. In fact, continuously eating the word makes you feel so full. I truly have felt the fullness that comes with eating the Word. For real, your flesh feels so full. How can you be physically full by eating only the Word of God? You truly feel full somehow. I have personally experienced it. Therefore, 
I know what it's like to be full through the word. In the scripture, Jesus told the woman about the gospel near a well in Samaria. While telling her about the gospel, the disciples came and gave him food. The disciples said, Lord, eat something, you must be hungry. Then what did the Lord say? The Lord said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? They were thinking about physical food. But the Lord said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Delivering the gospel to them is the Lord's food which saves souls through the gospel. I know the meaning of those words. You really feel so full upon doing this. Brothers and sisters, when you are back from fishing souls for the Lord, I can't even begin to describe in words the feeling of being so full. This is what fullness feels like when we complete the work assigned by the Lord. Furthermore, when you constantly meditate on His Word, you won't even notice how full you are despite not having eaten physical food. You will feel so full. There is a huge difference between simply reading the Word and deeply meditating on the Word. This chapter is about meditating on the Word. There are three ways of meditating on the Word. Meditation in Hebrew is Haga, which has three meanings. Firstly, after reading the Word, we receive the Word in our heart. And then we constantly think about it in our mind, which is what cud chewing is like. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. So, think of it to yourself while doing the dishes and even doing laundry the Lord is my shepherd. Then I am a sheep and just think that the Lord is my shepherd. This is what the Haga is, meditating and thinking in your mind without speaking. The second meaning of this meditation is to recite and confess the word in a quiet voice. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. For the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, how God loved the world. Oh, I see. It means that God loved the world so much that he killed his one and only Son, but. This is how I meditate using the second method. Earlier, the Word said that David constantly recited the Word in a quiet manner. Thirdly, you can proclaim it in a loud voice as if a lion were roaring. Now, let's have a look at the book of Psalm chapter 119 verse 13. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth this is proclaiming it. This is what proclaiming the Word with a loud voice is like. With loud voice, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. Thank you, God. I am surely your sheep and the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. So, I lack nothing. Thank you, God. The Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. That is how to proclaim with a loud voice. In fact, meditation consists of proclaiming, declaring, and thinking. Now, let's discuss the results of this meditation. What sort of benefits come after meditating? Normally, we read through the Bible like a book. Meditation, however, is pondering on one verse, reciting it, and declaring it loudly for some time. And then, certain revelations may come to us. Let's look at the result of meditation. As we read earlier in Psalms 1 verse 3, the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on it day and night, is the blessed one. And what are the results of meditating on the word of God day and night is in verse 3. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruits in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Amen. It says that whoever meditates on the word thrives, and whatever they do prospers. Well, what happens to the one who meditates, ponders, and declares it in a loud voice? Whatever he does prospers. It is said that he is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruits in season and whose leaf does not wither because water flows constantly. 
Brothers, now you realize how important meditating on the Word is, don't you? Want to succeed? Want to thrive? Then meditate on it. Let's look at the book of Joshua 1 chapter 8 to see the consequences of meditating on the Word. It says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Amen. Let me read it again, Keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Amen. Yes. Indeed, where should we always keep the word on? Our lips. It says to always keep the book of the law on your lips. It's telling us to always keep it on our lips and constantly meditate on it day and night. And don't just meditate on it but act upon it as it is written. If you do so, then your path will be straight and whatever you do will prosper. Indeed, prosperity and success are promised when we meditate on the Word. Brothers and sisters, the one who meditates on it firmly grasps the Scripture and says, Lord, since I am meditating on it, please give me the results, and takes it as if already received. Then what is the result of it? It will be done, for God is sincere. So, who should practice this the most? The one who loves the Lord, the one who runs corporations, and the one who does business, indeed. Let's look at the book of Psalm chapter 119,99. It says I have more insight than all my teachers for I meditate on it all day long. It is written in my KJV Bible it makes us insightful and prudent. Those who meditate on it all day long becomes wiser. Brothers and sisters, don't you want to be wise? Yes, I know I do. I want to become wise and insightful so I can know the Lord. If so, then meditate on the Word a lot. As much as possible. Let's look at the book of Psalms 111 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, all who follow His precepts have good understanding. To Him belongs eternal praise. Amen. It says that the man who fears the Lord has true wisdom and understanding. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So all who follow His precepts have good understanding. All who obey His commandments will grow in wisdom, right? Yes. Indeed, there are so many promises given to us by God. However, the problem is that we don't keep His word, right? We should really strive to be the ones with good understanding. People who sincerely fear the Lord have true wisdom and good understanding. Those who keep His commandments will have good understanding, which can also be a result of meditation. Looking at the course book, it says that we can receive many revelations through meditation on the Word of God. Let's look at the book of John chapter 1 verse 4. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. In Him was light. In whom? In Jesus, in the Word, there is the life, and this life became the light of men. Thus, those who don't have this life don't have light within them. Then I meditated on the meaning of this life. God, what is this life? Lord, what is this life that you refer to? In this way, I briefly wrote on how to meditate. Lord, what is this life that you refer to in this scripture? I asked in this way. Ah! The life mentioned in this scripture is linked to verses 3 and 4. In Jesus, in the Word, there is the life that is the light of men. Ah! Then this life is the light of men? And I said, so then the Word of the Lord is the light of men, meaning Jesus is the light of men. Then it follows that those who don't have the life of Jesus don't have light in them. This is the conclusion I eventually reached. Lord, then those who don't have the life and the Word in them have no light. Then they are nothing but darkness. Therefore, it said that all unbelievers are in darkness, the darkness. 
when we are born again, from heaven's perspective, only our spirits shine with light. However, our souls and bodies are still pitch black in the darkness. Because I'm born again, my spirit is the only component that is brimming with light. This is why we are told that live in accordance with the spirit. So I said, ah, Lord, that means unbelievers have no light in them. Such people have no light in them. Because unbelievers lack light, they live in darkness. If they accept the life, however, they will have light in them. Then God will see them as living beings. It means that the reason Jesus came down to earth was to give us life in this way, I meditate. If you're not sure about where to begin meditating, Brothers and sisters, first meditate on the book of Psalm chapter 23 verse 1, it is a psalm of David, and it's a great start. You can meditate on it in your mind or recite it out loud when doing the dishes, doing laundry, etc. When no words come to mind during meditation and you're unsure, ask the Lord. Lord, it's written that the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Lord, you are my shepherd, and I am your sheep so I lack nothing, but in reality, I'm lacking in money. Lord, I need money. But Lord, why is it written that I lack nothing even though I need money? From my point of view, I'm lacking in something, but you said that I lack nothing. Lord, tell me why this is happening. Ask the Lord in this way. Then the Lord begins to teach us from within. Indeed, the Lord is in us, and he will give to us if we ask him. The Lord has already given us all the blessings from heaven. So, if we command in the name of Jesus, money will be delivered to us. It's just that we don't know about this process and are too spiritually immature. We simply look at our own circumstances and say, Lord, I am so lacking. It's because we fail to acknowledge the fact that He is in us and has already given all things to us. Ask the Lord, and He will teach you. If you have read the Bible many times, the Holy Spirit links scriptures and makes connections between them like puzzle pieces during meditation. Therefore, reading the Bible frequently is very important and valuable. Now let's shift gears and talk about proclamation or confession prayers. Ideally, proclaiming the scriptures themselves is the best way to go about it, but beginners might want to start off by using any confession prayer books available in stores. Nowadays, there are a variety of confession prayer books. Most of them are fine to use. But make sure to use books that are consistent with the Bible and its scriptures. Don't use the book if it is inconsistent with the Bible. Because when we receive an answer to our prayers from God, it should be according to the Bible and the will of God. Now, I will illustrate the different ways of proclaiming. The Ways and Methods of Proclaiming Psalms 91, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 13, Matthew 5-7, Hebrews 11, Psalms 119, Psalms 23 are just some of the scriptures I used to declare. Alternatively, if you want to start off using confession prayer books available in bookstores, I used the one published by the Word of Faith author and pastor Sun A. E. Choi. I had declared it a lot. In China, we translated it into Chinese and proclaimed it many times with our brothers and sisters. It was very helpful, and it's a good book to start off with. If you don't have it, however, you can proclaim the Bible itself like we do. Declare the Bible verses themselves. If you want to proclaim the book of Psalms chapter 91, for example, try this method first. I will demonstrate the way I do it, but don't think that this is the only way. For the direction in which the Holy Spirit leads and moves you may be different from how He leads me. So let the Holy Spirit guide you as you follow Him. This is the method I have utilized. Let's look at the book of Psalms chapter 91, I will use my King James Version. First, open your Bible and read it with a loud voice. Let's read it. KJV, Psalm 91 verses 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. 
The purpose of me reading it aloud is so that my mind can absorb and internalize this message. I'm taking the message to heart. Shortly he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Amen. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that fleeth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Amen. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Amen. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. Amen. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Amen. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him, I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him, and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him, and shew him my salvation. Amen. In this way, proclaim the scriptures of interest in a loud voice during your first round. This is the practice of proclaiming the book of Psalms chapter 91. Then, during your second time through proclaiming, change it into your own words, your own words. For example, look at verse 3 where it says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. When you say He is my refuge and my fortress, replace the word my with your name. For example, I would say, He is Sunmi Sun's refuge. This is what I mean when I say replace the words we or I with your name and then declare. It's done like this. I will say of the Lord, He is Sunmi Sun's refuge and Sunmi Sun's fortress. Sunmi's God, in Him will Sunmi trust. Surely he shall deliver Sunmi from the snare of the fowler, and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover Sunmi with his feathers, and under his wings shalt Sunmi trust. His truth shall be Sunmi's shield and buckler. I can't help but shed tears when reading the scripture like this. When I insert my name in the scripture, the meaning of the word becomes more personal and hits you deep. Truly, the word of truth becomes Sunmi Sun's shield and buckler. The word of God turns into my shield. No matter what fiery arrows the devil fires at me, the word of truth, God, becomes my shield and protects me. Therefore, I have no fear. Thus, the Lord said to me, no matter what anyone says to you, don't waver or falter. Because I am your shield. My word is your shield. The word comforts and leads me. I sincerely love the word of the Lord. I truly love it. Brothers and sisters, I love our Lord so much. When he was on earth, though he was rich, he became poor for our sake. He was born as the son of a carpenter even though he could have born in a good family. Nevertheless, he was born in a family of the lowest class worked as a carpenter, was unattractive, and was so thin with hollow cheeks. As it says in the book of Isaiah chapter 53, he had no beauty that we should desire him. Nowadays, so many people get plastic surgery to improve their appearance. But our Lord isn't attractive in the slightest, so for those of you who are unattractive, don't stress yourself over it. Our God wouldn't exchange you for any nation in the world because you are his most prized possession. Truly, we are honored and preciously treated by the Lord. Brothers and sisters, are you uneducated? It's okay. Don't worry or stress over it. Our Lord didn't even go to school. At least you graduated from elementary school while the Lord didn't. Did you not even finish elementary school? That's fine. He didn't graduate elementary school either. Peter couldn't even hope to start school. 
therefore, there is no reason to be stressed about academics. Despite this, the whole world knows of Peter, doesn't it? Yes, they know of Peter who was made into a well-known person. How? By his knowledge of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, knowing the Lord is all that matters. Do you lack wisdom? I have an IQ of 83, but none of that matters. Read the Bible diligently. The Lord will raise us up if we do so. Whether you have a PhD or a master's degree doesn't matter. Only listen to what God says to you and live in accordance with the Bible. God seeks such simple-minded people. If God is going to use someone who is full of worldly knowledge, he must thoroughly break down and discard such knowledge like Paul did. Look at those whom the Lord used, the twelve disciples, Peter, James, John were all simple-minded people. Their thoughts were extremely simple, they simply obeyed as told. Brothers and sisters, they had great faith. They just followed the Lord and left behind their belongings, job, family, and so on. Such people are the ones the Lord seeks. Not those who are full of the world's knowledge and ways. There's no reason to be afraid. This world has nothing on us. The Lord taught me that there is a lion in front of us, which seems big and intimidating. So many Christians walk this way through the bridge that the lion is standing on. And they all need to pass through the bridge in front of them. So many have made it up until this point. But they hesitate to pass through the bridge because they fear the lion's roar. They tremble in fear. Yet, one person bravely stands up and walks through the bridge. But the rest of them don't want to pass through the bridge because they fear the lion. But this brave person goes through the road, relying on the Lord. And at the end of the road, he discovers that the lion was just a billboard all along. It is just a billboard with a picture of a lion. The remaining Christians take it for a real lion so they are too afraid to move forward. But when the brave Christian realizes it is just a billboard, he pushes it down to the ground. He then signals to the other Christians that it's safe to move. This is the analogy the Lord taught me, saying that the world is the billboard. We are told to push down the world in the name of Jesus and move forward. This is what he taught us to do. God said that the world is nothing but a piece of cake for you. As Caleb and Joshua said, if you trust in the Almighty God who is in you, the world will appear insignificant from God's perspective. Caleb and Joshua said that the giants they saw were mere grasshoppers before God. So they had the confidence to say they should go and conquer the giants since they were nothing but grasshoppers before God. But those who see the billboard as a real lion can't pass the bridge. Such people are like the ten spies. They just go by what they see. They considered themselves to be grasshoppers compared to the giants, so there was no fear of God among them. These are thoughts of the flesh. Brothers and sisters, go and knock it down, it is just a billboard. We move forward and live by faith in His Word because He is the truth, which sets us free and gives us life. There's no room for fear. We are dead to the world, so it can't do anything to me. Thus, we continue to move forward in the name of Jesus. In the same way, if you put your trust in Jesus, go ahead and stand firm as soldiers of Christ. Stand firm before the words of Jesus Christ. He told me that the Bible is incomprehensible unless the Holy Spirit makes you understand. Only through the Holy Spirit is the word understandable. The Bible and the Holy Spirit go hand in hand, so we should remain balanced. As we have read earlier in the book of Joshua, he said that we shouldn't be tilted. Indeed, we shouldn't be tilted. Satan causes us to be tilted, even within the word, the demons cause us to be lopsided towards a specific verse and take it out of context. No. You must be balanced. Surely, two wings of a plane are needed in balance as well indeed. He told me that if we understand his love, we should learn to fear him as well. These are the wings of a plane. If all you know about is God's love, you may still struggle when leaving certain sins. 
Ideally, we would be completely free from sins, but there are some that are difficult to free yourself from without the fear of the Lord. If you fear the Lord in addition to loving Him, however, you can be completely free. This is why God said that love and fear for Him should go hand in hand like two wings of a plane. Like so, the Bible and the Holy Spirit should go together. He said that this is the house built on the rock. What he means here is that he has given us all the materials necessary to build a house. And the instructor, who has been assigned to show us how to build the house, is the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament era, Matthew 7 talks about building the house on a rock. So all the materials needed for building the house have been given to us. And the Holy Spirit helps us interpret the Bible, which is the Word of God. The materials to be used for building the house are bricks, which are the words of God in the Bible. We must build a house with the Word of God as its foundation, but the one who physically builds the house is me, not the Holy Spirit. I myself need to put effort into this. Some of you may get lazy and say, Lord, you can do this yourself, you yourself can go evangelize. I'm not doing anything, Lord, you pray on your own. I don't even come out before you. Lord, read the word by yourself. I'll just sit back and watch TV in the meantime. No. This is not how God made us to be. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads us, an instructor who teaches us how to build the house. But who actually builds it? We ourselves should build it. The Lord has already given us for He has given us the bricks to use, which is the Bible. Thus, we can start the construction. However, there are certain people who don't want to begin construction. Simply put, those who don't deny themselves are not fit to build. Therefore, even though you have the bricks, the Word of God, at your disposal, you can't begin utilizing them without self-denial. Indeed, you can't hope to keep the Word without denying yourself. After denying yourself and creating free space in the process, replace where you formerly used to be with the bricks, the Word of God. Now, think of this as the foundational base, the rock, upon which bricks, or the Word, should be placed. But, when I try to place the Word down there, that space is already occupied by myself. For example, if I have thoughts that covet money, they must be thrown out. And only then can I put down the brick and start building. Now when I try to place the second brick down, my desire for recognition and acknowledgement in this world is blocking the way. Then I have to throw out the selfish desire for a good reputation in the world. After that, you now have space to add one more word of God onto your house. This is the process by which we can build our house. Towards the completion of construction, the house will contain the fruits of the Holy Spirit. After all, what is the end result of stacking up the Word of God? Holiness, from which the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit manifest in our flesh. How amazing is this? This is what Jesus has taught me. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, so we can't be detached and we also bear fruit in the process. What sort of fruits are produced? Brothers and sisters, when the Bible talks about fruits, it's mostly referring to the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. He said, you often assume that I was referring to the number of church members at revival when I talk about fruits. You're mistaken. I never said that. The fruits written in the Bible refer to the fruits that the vine bears, which are the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. The nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Like so, we build our house by the Word of God. Without self-denial, we can't build it, the Word can't be placed down for use. Where will you place the Word inside of you when your own thoughts are already occupying that space? The only way to make space for the Word is to throw your own thoughts and desires out. Now the third method of proclamation is to convert the Word into prayer. Let me demonstrate how to convert it into prayers. Going back to Psalm 91 verse 2 where it says that the Lord is my refuge, I can pray, Lord, yes, you are. You are my refuge, and I am not afraid. 
when I take refuge in you, no evil can confront me. I take the Most High as my stronghold, so neither disaster nor disease can stay in my stronghold. No such disease is in Lord's fortress. And no such disease can come near the tent of Lord. Like so, proclaim the written words into prayers. Continuing on to verse 4, He will cover you with His feathers. Transforming the word into prayers. He will cover Sunmi Sun with His feathers, He will shelter Sunmi Sun with His wings. Thank you, Lord. I see that you have wings and that they are my refuge. Thank you, Lord. I truly give thanks. The Lord has wings, so He takes us under them to shelter us. In Psalm chapter 91 verse 4, it clearly says that the Lord has wings. But I asked myself, how does He have wings? Last time I saw Him, He had no wings. How is this possible? But Lord, Scripture says that you have wings. Therefore, you must have wings. But according to my Son, who has seen the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in heaven and has been there fifty times. The Holy Spirit has wings. He said that the Holy Spirit has wings. Oh, so that's how it is. Son, I can truly find refuge under His wings as it's written in Psalms 91 verse 4, and under His wings you will find refuge. Before this revelation, I used to say, Lord, apparently you have wings during proclamation. At that time, I convinced myself that God had wings since Scripture says so. But when I personally met Jesus in heaven, I didn't see any wings so I was confused, thinking, how is this possible? Despite my confusion, I decided to trust in what the Scripture said about him and believe that he has wings. After my son enlightened me on this, then I said, ah, now I understand why the Lord wrote in the Scripture that he has wings. Truly, I can proclaim I take refuge under the Lord's wings, so I am not afraid in the slightest. And proclaiming no calamity overcomes me for I live in the shelter of the Most High and He is my refuge. Lord, You are my refuge. I will hide in You when I am in trouble for the Lord is my refuge. I really feel safe in Him. Because He protects me. You will trample upon lions and cobras, you will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. Amen. Indeed, God, you said that I tread on the lion and the cobra, I will trample the great lion and the serpent. Amen. For you are with me, I can tread on anything that harms me. I can trample over any evil thing, for you are with me. This is because the Lord is with me. I praise the Emmanuel God. In this way, we declare the word. Then, if we declare the word in faith even for ten minutes, we feel tremendous energy coming out of our body. Brothers and sisters, in Psalm 18 verse 1, it says, Lord, you are my strength, my shield, my deliverer and my stronghold. Repeat that several times in faith, close your eyes and picture the throne of God in your mind and speak to Lord saying, Lord, you are my shield, my strength, my deliverer, my stronghold of whom I praise and love, and you are also my help. In this manner, declare the word over and over. Within ten minutes or so, you will feel a surge of power drawing out of your body. Don't just listen to what I'm saying, try it out yourself for the experience. Are you facing difficulties? Then do it every day. Even if you're not facing tough times, do it every day so that you can go out boldly and confidently. What is there for us to be confident in any way? Are you attractive, rich in finances, and or highly educated according to worldly standards? No, you don't measure up to its standards at all. But whom do we have in us? We have the Lord, the living God who walks with us, dwelling within us by faith in Christ. The key to overcoming the world is through our faith in Jesus. Our faith. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How was David's faith in the Lord? He was merely a child armed with nothing more than just a few sling stones when he approached Goliath. He was just a kid. However, when he got there, he said, I come here in the name of the Almighty Lord. 
having faith in the name of the Lord, David moved forward. Whom else would the Lord help if he doesn't deliver someone like David who walked by faith alone? If the Lord doesn't even help someone who puts his own name and glory at stake, whom else would he deliver? When we walk forward in the name of Jesus Christ, don't you think he would help us? Of course, he would. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you should practice this on your own and declare the word every day consistently. A preacher, David Robertson, said that if you're going to pray for three hours, proclaim for an hour, speak in tongues for the second hour, and then bow and confess for the third hour. Confession and proclamation prayers are the same thing. Proclaim the word when reading it aloud and convert it into your words as I mentioned earlier by replacing your name in for the word my. Then, you will experience the deep intimacy that God approaches you with. Suddenly, I begin weeping out of thanksgiving and repent for lacking faith in the Word. In general, if you're teaching and raising people under you, you'd call them your disciples. In fact, we are all disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Personally, I like the term, disciples of Jesus Christ and I enjoy exalting only Him. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, and so are the rest of you. When I was in China, some people said to me, Teacher, I want to be your disciple. They would often say, I want to be a disciple of Sunny Sun. In response, I said, I am not a mentor, but the one in me, Jesus Christ, is. The Holy Spirit is your mentor. We are all co-disciples, so let's all be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just happen to have started this journey a little bit earlier than you, so I can guide you. Let's move forward together, I said. I really hate it when people praise me. Only Jesus Christ alone should be praised. I hope you also have the same attitude, and it should be a given that only the Lord is to be exalted and praised. Brothers and sisters, stop exalting your pastors, and pastors, please don't delight in being praised by them. This is a dangerous trap that will lead to disaster. The Lord said to me, Many pastors have taken my seat. These pastors have taken the praise intended for Jesus Christ and so are being exalted higher than Him by the brothers and sisters in the church. Brothers and sisters, know that if you all keep praising and exalting your pastors, you yourselves are corrupting them. They should be exalted only by God. The important thing is for the pastors to exercise self-control and immediately reject the praise. Brothers and sisters, never praise me, Jesus Christ alone must be praised. Don't praise him through my name. Many people say, it is all thanks to my pastor that I became such and such. It is because of what my pastor did that such and such happened. Don't ever speak or think like this. Even if the pastor was used as a tool by God, we would give all the credit to God for the outcome. We should praise only God. In turn, Jesus will exalt the pastors. This is the proper way and order of being exalted. We need more of this. We, fellows and preachers, should always be humble. In other words, I must disappear. To be meek is to be like fine flour going through a grinder. You must become selfless. The one who has no selfish thoughts, emotions, and one who completely denies themselves is the person who is meek and humble. Scripture says that Moses always obeyed God's words for he is meek. In the same manner, we ourselves should take up that role. What role? Instead of praising preachers, we must continuously pray for them. Pray that they would follow God alone, that they would fulfill God's will alone, that they would fulfill the calling of their churches, that they would focus on their callings without distractions. That they may become more intimate with God, that they may kneel down before God and hear from Him. And that they would obey God's commands and be full of the Holy Spirit. How would you teach about the Lord without first knowing Him yourself? What do you teach? What do preachers and missionaries teach? They teach about Jesus Christ. They focus on who Jesus Christ is. Teachings that focus on other things instead of Him are false teachings that ends in failure. What kind of teaching would the Lord appreciate? 
he'd want us to teach others to obey and continue doing all that the Lord had commanded them to do. Leading fellows to focus on him and making sure they keep his commandments is a successful ministry. Having all the fellows fixate their hearts and minds solely on Jesus is the goal. If someone asks you whom you want to meet in heaven, you might say you would like to meet David, Abraham, and so on. However, you should try going to heaven yourself and see what happens. Sure, you might be interested in David and Abraham, but they're not the central figures there. Your eyes, as well as everyone else's, will be fixated on Jesus. Wherever he goes, you and the rest will follow, it's all about Jesus, for he is the King of Kings. Now, the entire word of God is a yes in Christ, so I should take it as mine to proclaim. Let's look at the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. This verse is very important. Once a year, we draw verses from a lottery, and the verse I get is always useful and relevant. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. However, we don't live by this specific verse alone, but all scriptures within the 66 books of the Bible are a yes in Christ. It means that I can take it as mine in the name of Jesus. Therefore, I can take those words and live in accordance with them as much as I want. This is how different things are in the New Testament. Then, we can take any of the words of God as ours to proclaim. In my case, when I need to pray for something that requires money, I look for scriptures which are related to finance and declare them. In the same manner, if healing is needed, declare 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. Declare or apply the words into your circumstances. As I have promises from God, I can present them before the Lord and speak to Him with these. According to His promises, He answers my prayers, so we should believe them for this to work. This is how we can receive them. Look at the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 to 19 that I pray with often. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength. Amen. I proclaim this scripture when I am in need of revelation to understand the meaning of certain scripture. You proclaim this daily before reading the Bible or praying. I apply it in the same way I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give Son me Son, insert your name, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that I may know him better. I pray that the eyes of Sunmi Sun's heart may be enlightened in order that Sunmi Sun may know the hope to which he has called Sunmi Sun. Lord, let Sunmi Sun know what her calling is, teach Sunmi Sun what her purpose in life is. This is what I'm getting at. Secondly, ask him to reveal what are the riches of the glory of our inheritance in the saints. God, what is the wealth you have given to me? Lord, reveal it to me. Thirdly, ask him to help us understand how great the power of the Holy Spirit is working in believers. This is very important. When we lay hands on people, they get healed. We need to know the extent of that healing power. Therefore, we pray in this way, proclaim it daily. In that scripture, replace the word me slash my with your name and declare it. Now, once it's on your lips, request to God strongly, Lord, may the eyes of my heart be enlightened in order that I may know the hope to which you have called me. Lord, shouldn't you inform me of my calling if I am to be used by you? How can I hope to move forward without even knowing my calling? God, even if you won't tell me my ultimate calling yet, at least teach me what my present calling is. The book of Ephesians chapter 3 verses 16 to 19 is about love, which is important to proclaim as well. Lord, teach me to know how wide and long and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Ask before God, and proclaim it since it has become yours. We must proclaim in steadfast faith without wavering. The scripture clearly says that he who promised is faithful. 
look at the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. He has promised in this way, hasn't he? Therefore, when we confess our words and proclaim with faith, we should firmly grasp and hold on to them unswervingly. For he is faithful, he gives it to us. Look at verse 35, so do not throw away your confidence, it will be richly rewarded. Confidence. You should firmly hold on to that confidence. Never let go of it. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 says the same thing, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Amen. We shouldn't lose faith in our confessions. Say to this mountain, go throw yourself into sea. What does it mean to say? It is a confession and declaration. Which, if you believe without a shadow of doubt in your heart, it will be done. Believe it. Hold on to it firmly. This is why these are called proclamation and commanding prayers. Earlier, I said that you feel full of the Spirit when you meditate on the Word. You truly feel full. In general, people have quiet time with the Lord in the morning. I also mentioned this in the previous chapter. We really need a time of quiet meeting with God. I myself love to pray alone more than I like intercessory prayers in a group. I love having a personal prayer time with the Lord. Technically speaking, we are not alone with the Lord in prayer because there are angels surrounding us as well. It's just that we don't see them, we are not alone with Him. Nevertheless, I am so happy and delighted during this time because I need intimacy with God. I love praying alone during quiet time in the morning because I get to start off the day with the Lord. Don't get distracted by other things in the morning. If you are a busy mom who has to take care of the kids early in the morning, then get up half an hour or one hour earlier than usual to have this quiet time with the Lord and start your day off with Him. Give it a try. After putting Him first that day, then you can resume doing house chores, you will feel the difference. During your quiet time, you can follow the sequence of praying, praising, bowing, and reading the Bible, for example. I've said before that it is beneficial to make a fixed schedule for this. That way, we won't push back or delay this intimate time with Him when other things come up. Yes. Without firmly setting up a quiet time schedule with the Lord, you will eventually push it back until after you deal with more urgent matters. This is the problem you run into without a consistent schedule. In my case, when I first met the Lord by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I woke up at 4 a.m. and had quiet time with the Lord until 7 a.m. I resumed doing routine chores after 7 a.m., such as cooking breakfast, getting my husband ready for work, taking my daughter to preschool, etc. Between getting my husband ready and sending my daughter off to school, I still have a little bit of time to do chores, so I start doing them. After taking my daughter to preschool, my mind can't resume doing the rest of the chores. So I pause doing chores, and I first go into the prayer room to seek him. In the prayer room, I grow closer to and intimate him until lunchtime. Around 1 p.m., I leave the prayer room for lunch and do some house chores swiftly. I do them speedily and go back to my prayer room until 5 p.m., I continuously have a relationship with him. While spending time with him, I check to see if there are enough leftovers for dinner so that I can feed my family. But if I need to go to a grocery, I take some time off for it. I save a little time for other stuff and spend the rest of my time with God. So sometimes my husband sees me sitting in the prayer room from his leaving for work to when he returns home. When he returns home from work, he still sees me in the prayer room. Then, he asked me have you really been in this room all day? I answered, yes, I have, excluding the break times I set aside for meals and stuff to do. To summarize, I spend at least 10 hours a day with the Lord and go to bed at midnight. I had those days for a while with the Lord. Later on in your walk of faith, there will be a time when God requests you to spend many hours with Him because He wants to train you through the Word and eventually use you for His purpose. Therefore, we need to set aside a period of time for training. 
spending the first hour of your day with the Lord during quiet time is so precious. Likewise, before going to bed, devote the last hour of your day to the Lord by praying and reading the Bible. Reflect on what you did and what happened today, and if you sinned along the way, make sure to repent. And then, read the Word and cleanse yourself before laying down in bed. Brothers and sisters, read the Bible more at night if you don't have enough time in the morning. You should read the Bible often so that God can use you for greater purposes later. How can you even hope to preach without having the Bible as your standard? This is what Lord requires. After reading it many times and meditating on it deeply, He requests that we live our lives according to Scripture. One day, He said to me, If you're not going to live by the Scripture, don't even bother preaching it. God truly wants us to live in accordance with the Word. Of course, there are times when we stumble and fall in our walk of faith in the Word. Sometimes we succeed, other times, we fail. Yet, we always get back on our feet and try again, we don't get discouraged because He is in us. As you continue to spend time with Him, He will naturally touch your heart. As you diligently read the Scripture, He guides you accordingly. All you have to do is keep asking Him questions. Each time he answers me, he responds with another question saying, what would Jesus do in this situation? I can't forgive the person who cursed at me. Then, if Jesus were me, what would he do? Indeed, he would forgive that person, so I should as well. Write down any feelings or revelations you receive from the Lord in a notebook so that you can use it to help you during your ministries. You can use any meditating book, but I don't recommend it. I use the Bible alone and sit down before God, I sit down before God only with a Bible and a notebook, and converse with Him one-on-one. -on -one. If you are a pastor or missionary like me, then all of the sources and titles of your sermon should come from God. The contents of the sermon, as well as the way you go about explaining it, should all come from God. And then preach it to the brothers and sisters, so that they may hear the revelations of God. I usually read one chapter of Proverbs every night, and I cleanse myself with the water of the Word. Before you lie down to rest, pray that God would protect your body, soul, and spirit overnight. And begin speaking in tongues in bed so that you can sleep while in spiritual mode and have spiritual dreams. Have trouble sleeping? Look at the book of Isaiah chapter 28 verse 11 to 12 very well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues God will speak to these people, to whom he said this is the resting place, let the weary rest. In bed, try to speak in tongues for a while and think of him with a peaceful mind. Give it a try and go to sleep. The next morning, you will be full of energy. For the scripture is the truth. It is written in the book of Isaiah 28, verses 11 to 12, very well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues God will speak to these people. To whom he said, this is the resting place, let the weary rest. Cling to it, and go to sleep. Alternatively, it is good to meditate on the New Testament in the morning and on the Old Testament in the evening. Brothers and sisters, the best way to go about it is to let the Holy Spirit lead you. When you get up in the morning and feel like reading the book of Matthew chapter 5, then read that instead of going back to where you left off last time. Right now, the Holy Spirit is putting it in your heart to read the book of Matthew chapter 5, He has something to say to you through this. For instance, it could be an answer to your prayer. Therefore, I pray that you become sensitive in hearing the voice of God. We'll finish chapter 11 of Christ's Army Tanning Course here.